All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending today's webinar on the relationship between regulators and power utilities, evaluating the prudency of cybersecurity investments. My name is Jake Swanson, and I'm a program coordinator at the U.S. Energy Association on the Energy Utility Partnership Program based in Washington, D.C. Please note this webinar is being recorded and all participants are muted with their video turned off. You're welcome and encouraged to post questions either in the chat or in the Q&A box below. I'll be monitoring them and passing them on to our presenters as appropriate. Uh, just to give a brief background on USEA, uh, we're a nonprofit membership association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations, and government agencies. USEA represents the broad interests of the US energy sector by increasing the understanding of energy issues both domestically and internationally through capacity building activities such as this one. Uh, this series of webinars is financed through our cooperative agreement with the US Agency for International Development, uh, the Energy Utility Partnership Program, and in particular through uh, USAID's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education and Environment, E3 Bureau. Uh, this is the 13th webinar in our series on digitalization and cybersecurity. You can find re uh, recordings of past webinars on our website at usca.org slash events. Um, and if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see uh, some of our past webinars. Uh, please join us in the coming weeks as we cover other areas of cybersecurity um, that are of importance to all of you working to strengthen the security and reliability of electric utilities. Um, we have two more left as this is the 13th uh, webinar out of 15. Um, and I will pass uh, the floor over to Jamila Amodeo uh, from the US Agency for International Development. Hello, thank you, Jake. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Jamila Amodeo, Senior Energy Advisor with the USAID's Global Energy and Infrastructure Office. In today's webinars, our presenters, Elena Ragazzi of CNR I-R-C-R-E-S and Michael Colau of Arizona Public Service will share with us how regulators and utilities assess cybersecurity risk and determine appropriate priority investments using metrics, assessments, benchmarking, and other tools. We'll discuss one of the most difficult questions um, being posed to utilities and regulators, whether it's possible and how to evaluate the effectiveness of cybersecurity investments. As always in this series, we will learn two perspectives on this topic. Elena will provide the regulatory perspective as regulators approve investments that are then passed on to electricity tariffs. Um, and Michael will provide the utilities perspective. Elena is joining us from Italy where she along with her colleagues developed a first of its kind guidelines on evaluating the prudency of cybersecurity investments. Uh -huh. The guidelines were develop developed for USAID through its cooperative agreement with the National Association of Regulatory Utilities Commissioners, NERU, under the Europe Eurasia uh, Regional Program. We are happy to have Elena share the guidelines with our partners on the global platform. Um, I wanted to thank both of our uh, presenters for presenting with us today. I just want to remind that last week this, we discussed industrial control system risks and solutions with Del Rodias of Palo Alto and Michael Falkovich of Con Edison. If you missed that very informative and engaging webinar, please visit USCA's website for both, uh, to both watch its recording and to download both presentations. Also, while on the USCA website, please don't forget to register for the last two webinars that Jake mentioned. Uh, the last webinar will take place on November 4th, on, which is Wednesday. Um, please note that following this webinar series, USA together with USEA will host two industry panels that will feature representatives of uh, leading US cybersecurity firms that will discuss international trends, latest developments uh, that are uh, being developed by their firms and in general, um, the topics are cyber threats, intrusion detection, and testing, which will uh, take place on November 18th, and cyber risk management through measurement that will take place on December 2nd. This will be a nice continuation to get the perspective of um, cyber developers, uh, vendors, manufacturers to this topic. 
uh, we're discussing today. We'll post more information on the upcoming panels on the USDA website. For utility representatives who are watching this webinar, please write to us if you would like to join USA, USDA Business Innovation Partnership, as Jake mentioned. Uh, well, this is an initiative where we support utility champions to in integrate innovative technologies to better meet increasing customer expectations, to effectively adapt to new regulatory frameworks, adopt new business models, and to implement business procedures and processes. Um, so we welcome your uh, participation and uh, write to us. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, not only utilities, but everybody who's joining us today. Um, we value all your questions, your feedback. Um, please keep safe, keep positive. And with that, I'll give the floor back to Jake. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Um, again, today's webinar is on the relationship between regulators and power utilities. Um, the implementation of cybersecurity measures is typically the responsibility of power system operators. However, one important consideration is that regulators have an obligation to ensure that cybersecurity investments are reasonable, prudent, and, and effective. We'll cover some key topics today, including uh, how should the regulators and companies interact in establishing a global cybersecurity strategy for the country, um, and how can regulators identify and benchmark cybersecurity uh, costs. Today, we have the pleasure of having Elena Rogazzi, who has been working at CNR, I-R-C-R-E-S, um, which is the Research Institute on Sustainable Economic Growth of the National Research Council of Italy. Um, she's been there as a researcher since 1989, um, and she is now a research director and external professor at the Polytechnic Institute of Turin. Uh, she is the author of more than 250 works of applied economics and policy evaluation. Uh, she was the project leader of several projects, both European and national, coordinating the action of numerous partners um, and integrating multidisciplinary working groups. Also presenting today is Michael Coleo, uh, who is the manager of data protection and assurance at the Arizona Public Service, APS. Michael has been the manager of data protection and assurance uh, within APS's cybersecurity group since 2014. His team is responsible for the internal controls framework supporting the protection of APS's personally identifiable information of customers and employees, critical infrastructure protection, CIP, um, Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, export compliance. Uh, the ongoing monitoring and, and evolving of a data protection program along with its training and awareness are focal points to the success of his team. Uh, so thank you again, Elena and Michael um, for presenting today. And with that, I will pass the floor over to Elena. Yes, thank you very much, Jake. I'll share my screen now. Excellent. Perfect. So first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to this interesting webinar series uh, to present uh, the work done uh, on the guidelines. I am really convinced that uh, the double perspective of regulators and of companies is fundamental to ensure a good protection of uh, our power systems. Uh, what are the guidelines? Well, the guidelines are a document uh, which uh, distinguishes itself uh, for a regulatory perspective. And uh, the idea is that uh, the guidelines should assist the regulators uh, in establishing a regulatory approach and uh, so uh, helping uh, uh, to enhance the protection of their power system. So now, why to speak? speak about this uh, to an audience which is uh, made above all uh, of uh, companies, then because uh, we will see very soon in my presentation that uh, uh, the general uh, cybersecurity strategy implies uh, interaction among the two types of stakeholder in a kind of cooperation which is not easy at all to establish. 
it must be said that this document uh, was prepared uh, in a, by the colleagues of my institute for the NARUC, for a project implemented by the NARUC and uh, funded by USAID, and uh, in a specific context, which, context, which is uh, the southeast of uh, Europe. But uh, revision after revision, uh, I think that the final document has a, indeed uh, a general value because uh, it is clear that uh, priorities may differ, but uh, principles are common. So which are the context of the, the contents of the guidelines, uh, which I hope you will download and have a look at? Uh, well, there's a, there is an introduction uh, on the definition of uh, the cybersecurity strategy, then uh, a long part is devoted to the identification and benchmarking of cybersecurity cost. Then another part is devoted to performance assessment. And finally, there is a chapter on the regulatory approach to cybersecurity. And uh, by cost identification, we speak, uh, we mean speaking about the rationality of decisions, so understanding which are the right security measures to implement in each situation. On the other hand, by cost benchmarking, we refer to the cost that is to uh, the, the necessity to establish the right level of investment. And finally, by regulatory approach, we mean uh, the process, uh, which has to be done following certain rules to transform uh, uh, theories and ideas in decisions and implementation. Here you have uh, one of the reasons explaining uh, why it is important to have a dialogue among uh, regulators and companies. And it is, uh, the reason is that uh, in uh, any context, there is uh, a lot to do for both type of stakeholders. But the things that have to be done are different following the type of regulation implemented. And here you have a table taken from uh, the guidelines and a, a part of a table taken from the guidelines. And uh, there is the description of the situation in two opposite regulatory system, which are, of course, just two examples, much more exist. And well, take, for example, uh, the activity of cost identification in a, a compliance-based regulatory approach, it is up to the regulator to decide which are uh, the investment to do. Well, in the performance-based regulation, the practical cybersecurity strategy is decided by the company. The regulator does not assess the investment. On the other hand, it is the opposite as far as performance matrix. In performance-based regulation, they are at the heart of the regulation and there are the basis to calculate the economic incentive for the company. While in cost plus, for the regulator, just, they are just a way after the implementation to assess it and to understand if changes are needed. Well, now I will speak just, just a little on the problem of uh, the cooperation among companies and regulators on cybersecurity. Uh, when we speak of security, and in particular of cybersecurity, we have a perfect example of uh, what uh, we, the economics teacher, teachers, uh, say market failure. That is a situation in which private operators do not have enough incentives uh, to invest in that activity. On the other hand, we are all working in the, for, on the power system. We know that ensuring the protection of any node in an in interconnected network, it is fundamental. And so regulation is important. But in most cases, the problem is that in most cases, operators are better skilled and more informed on the evolution of the threats. 
And so they are in a better position to define and adapt the practical cybersecurity strategy. So it seems a dilemma with our solution. A uh, collaborative approach could be the, uh, the solution in this early phase in which regulators start to address cybersecurity. And the question that I leave to the floor, and in particular to Michael, is that uh, is this uh, approach possible? Is it effective? Is it reactive to the evolving situation? On my side, I will start answering with reference to an example which is quoted in the guidelines and which is uh, the Ofgem experience. Well, Ofgem is the British regulator and uh, they are preparing the national cybersecurity strategy and the regulation on, on this for uh, critical infrastructure, working uh, in cooperation with companies. So they show that it is possible. They show that it is effective because they are building up a good regulation, but they also show that it is not reactive. They are going on with this work along years and the regulation is not ready yet. So it is an issue. Let's pass to the next chapter uh, devoted to cost, that is cost identification and marking. Of course, it is a big, uh, a big chapter and I will just give you a test of some, uh, some of the contents. And my first page, is uh, uh, centered on the post process of uh, cost identification and uh, on uh, the quantification of the related cost. What you see here is the logical process uh, to be followed when you have to identify the countermeasures and the, then assess uh, the required cost, the required investment. The analysis, of course, uh, starts uh, to from uh, threats and from uh, the company vulnerabilities. Uh, together, these elements uh, contribute uh, to the risk assessment. Then you have the contribution given by standards and guidelines, uh, which uh, are represented by a reasoned list of countermeasures. So the company identifies the better countermeasures uh, to be implemented and understands the cost. Generally, what happens is that this is at the basis of any investment decision. But then I do two recommendations on that. Very often, this analysis is left uh, implicit. Well, I invite uh, uh, that uh, this uh, decision-making process is made explicit, and the company uses it uh, when interacting with the regulator for example, in the post-claim, but not only. This interaction should also help the regulators to understand that there will never be a unique receipt for cybersecurity. They, it would be interesting to know that uh, if you do A, B, C, D, you are okay, but it will never be so because threats and vulnerabilities are time-specific, place specific and context specific. And for this reason, the final step of the, this slide different from company to, they are different for, for, from company to company. And this is important that the regulators uh, understand it. A second very simple, but very important slide, establishing priorities. Uh, this is, uh, fundamental, for example, in transitioning economies, uh, such as the, the economies uh, involved in the Southeast uh, Europe project, uh, who are passing from a state-controlled power system to a market, a competitive market in uh, electricity. But it is always important because it is the basis when speaking about prudence. So when understanding uh, which are the fundamental investments, uh, but uh, not to invest uh, too much also. And so the, the priority ranking is the following. 
you have to start from strategy and organization, then to invest on people and process processes, and finally uh, in, uh, identify uh, which are your crown jewels, that is uh, the part of your systems that should be kept active even in case of a successful cyber attack, and finally, other infrastructure. Uh, I want uh, you to notice one fact that uh, at the top of the ranking, what you have, you have the soft aspects of cybersecurity. And this is particularly important, I was saying, in case of uh, low maturity companies or low maturity countries to avoid the risk that investments start before that the two fundamental aspects of the first two priorities are planned. Here you have a, a scheme of how works the benefit analysis. And the benefit analysis is a tool to understand priorities. And uh, it is a rather complex assessment because it is ma made of a first step, which is made of a technical ass assessment, which means an IT information assessment and an operational assessment. So understanding the vulnerabilities, the cyber attack scenario, and the effect on the cyber layer, layer and then the effect on the power system. Once you have this technical picture, you have to run the economic assessment of this impact on, uh, on the technical system. And here again, it is a complex assessment made of uh, uh, several calculations. You have to calculate uh, the impact on power companies, on other companies, and on private families. I am just showing these things. You have, uh, you'll find many details in the guidelines. And I would also want to underline that the benefit analysis may be used alone or included in a cost benefit analysis. Uh, here again, uh, I cannot go through all the details of the methodology, which is explained in the guidelines and in an appendix, but uh, I want to underline two things. And the first thing is that uh, here uh, you will see uh, some variables, uh, which are the variables of the cost benefit analysis, but uh, uh, which are also the, the, the main chapter of uh, the risk analysis. So I don't know if, if you, you will ever do a cost benefit analysis, but the topics addressed by, by this table are fundamental in your analysis uh, of the risk of your region, of your country, of your company. Second is uh, what is explained in this, uh, in this page, that is uh, the cost-benefit analysis is an evaluation. And an evaluation means to compare a situation with policy or with regulation or with investment and compare, take this uh, situation and compare it with a non-regulated situation. But in cybersecurity, there is one more difficulty. And the difficulty is that the outcome depends from an exogenous event, which is the cyber attack. The cyber attack may occur or not occur. So you have four evaluation scenarios to, to assess, and they result from the crossing of two dimensions, so the attack scenario and the regulation scenario. And for all of the four cells, you have to calculate a list of variables. The variables are uh, explained uh, very in, syn in synthesis in this uh, table. And uh, finally, if you calculate those variables, the cost benefit analysis simply results from the aggregation of these calculations. Here I show you an example of the results uh, obtained when applying this methodology. 
This has been done in a project funded by the European Commission and based on two case studies. A case study was centered on the generation, Italian generation system. And the second case study was based on the Polish transmission system operator. Uh, we have calculated the cost and the benefit of uh, implementing uh, a list of countermeasures. And uh, these are the results of the strict condensated juice of two year long project. Uh, there are many hints, many insights to be taken by this table. And uh, for example, uh, let's take uh, the first two columns. The first two columns refer to, to benefits. What do you see there? Uh, you see exactly what I was explaining at the beginning of my presentation. And that is the, the effect of uh, a cyber attack on the power companies is not irrelevant, but it is small, much smaller than the total damage. Uh, the category suffering the, the highest uh, damage is represented by families, by private households. Now take uh, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth column. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to use my mouse to show. It. What do you see there? Here you see two columns for the results of the cost assessment. The, the fourth column refers to the real situation of the Italian generation system and of uh, the Polish transmission system. Uh, that is, those are the investment required in those two countries. On the other hand, the final column explains the, what, uh, the level of investment required to a hypothetical non-existent company in which no countermeasure at all exists. Why we calculated this uh, column? Well, because it is uh, relevant for benchmarking and to understand how much is investment is still necessary. So what do you see there? Of course, uh, uh, you see that the investment is high, but it is not huge if compared to the total revenue of those companies and if compared to the total investments uh, done yearly by those companies. Second, what do you see? You see that the share of investment already done respect to the investment to be done, this one, is higher in transmission and lower in generation. So this is important for regulation. Keep an eye on the, uh, of mar on the market part of the power system because it is a part which is vulnerable. You, it may seem that it is less important because, uh, well, of course, the network is by definition one of the crown jewels, but they bear important vulnerabilities and they have little incentive to invest. Finally, what you see, we see again is that the benefit is much higher than uh, the cost. So investing is, uh, is positive, one should invest, but the problem is that the benefit is mainly social. So the society is bearing the benefits while without regulation, the company is bearing all the costs. So many, many interesting insight, but I say very difficult leveraging. So is it possible to say, well, I discovered that Arizona has more or less the same population than Italy, so is it possible to say that uh, the investment required for Arizona ranges uh, something with, like here? Well, the answer is not, of course, because 
for example, in Arizona, you have the biggest uh, nuclear power plant. We don't have a nuclear generation for a decision of uh, the population. So many things, uh, so many things are different that it is impossible to have a simple translation of these values based on the share of the territory. What you may do with some caution is to use some simple data uh, used to calculate uh, the, those general values. And these uh, basic values may be better used for, uh, to, for a further assessment. And for example, here you have a table concerning how much does it cost to implement uh, the organization, the management of cybersecurity, that is priority one. And uh, this assessment has been done by ENELF, that is a, a huge multinational company. Uh, and here you, you see in the third column, uh, the effort necessary when you first invest in your security program. And then in the last column, uh, the effort required to maintain this security program. Uh, of course, you may say this is, refers to a big company. Yes, it is true, but uh, it is also true that uh, governance costs suffer of a little scalability. And so uh, you may save a very little respect to this, uh, this table if you are a smaller country, uh, a smaller uh, company. The solution for small utilities and operators is uh, that of uh, uh, joining a federated security operation system. I go on, then you have two pages uh, showing some figures uh, uh, relative to generation and to transmission. I will skip because it is already late. And I will pass to my final chapter that is the issue of assessing effectiveness. So let's start again by some general principles, which is our aim when we speak about effectiveness. Well, we are not interested in output. What is output? Is the direct effect of our regulation or of our investment, it is easy, easy to measure because we have a lot of data. So this is why there is the picture uh, of this light because you have a lot of light on that. But it, it, this is not effectiveness. Effectiveness is represented by outcomes and outcomes are the change in the objective variables that are caused by our investment. And here the picture becomes much more complex because there is a mediation of the context and it is more difficult to find metrics to assess the outcome. Here I have done an example to explain the difference among output and outcome. And I invite the good uh, companies which already have a system of assessment and a, an internal metrics to ask themselves if they are measuring input, outputs, or outcomes, which is fundamental, a uh, fundamental assessment of their measurement system. And take, for example, uh, one investment, which is uh, a training course paid by the company and uh, on security procedures in communication with external parties. So the direct output is the number of participants attending the course and learning. So they pass the final test on theory. But the outcome is the fact that they change their behavior thanks to the, to the course. And so I may assess, for example, the number of mistakes in security procedures in the year after. And second, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't touch. 
the first aspect is important because it tells us uh, the intensity and the quality of our effort, but it is not effectiveness. Effectiveness is outcome. When speaking about outcome, finally, it is important to avoid to choose uh, unsensitive indicators. For example, uh, if we take uh, the number of IT system intrusions uh, the year after, this could prove to be an unsensitive indicator. We could, should choose uh, indicators, matrix, uh, which are sensitive to, uh, with uh, the problem, with the objective we are uh, assessing. A final observation, and uh, once you have chosen your indicators, your metrics, you have to assess them before and after your investment. But one more care, uh, this change should be compared to the change that you observe in a situation without the investment. This is not always the required, but it is fundamental. For example, when uh, you assess maturity of your staff, when the suspect, you have the suspect of that way effect. That is when you think that uh, there could be an improvement even without uh, your investment. So in our example, the impact will be the difference in the number of mistakes of the group participating to the training compared to another group of employees who did not participate to the training. Hey, Elena, um, can you uh, wrap up in the next few minutes? Yes, to give, I just uh, time for two Michael. or three more slides. Very okay, fun. sweet. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for a reminder. Uh, which is our problem with metrics? The problem if metrics is not only to understand how to implement the evaluation, but also to find the indicators in the case of cybersecurity. Because you have two types of, of metrics, that is maturity metrics, where you have a lot of experimented alternatives. Some of them are free, some of them are for paying, some of them are simpler or harder, but they are good experimented. On the other hand, performance metrics is more comprehensive, is what you need, but it is a complex system of indicators. It requires very good data collection tools and research and experimentation is ongoing. So there is not a clear way established in the literature. For example, one of the most mature and comprehensive approach we, we found when studying uh, the topic is the EPRI metrics. They have uh, prepared a system based of 121 data points. Then the, those are wrapped up in 45 uh, operational metrics, 10 tactical scores and three final strategical scores. And they have tested it, so showing it is feasible. It is a lot of boring work, but it is not work difficult. And they are still working on that. Here you have a graphical representation of the pre-matrix, which is the, then uh, the, the further problem with these metrics. First of all, that you have uh, to be able to collect all those metrics. They are a lot and you have to be mature to assess them. But the problem is also the use you do with those metrics. Uh, they are perfect for internal uses. So that is for the security team to understand what works, for the IT team to take a decision on security technologies. Both of them can use metrics to speak to, to the board so that the board understands and manages well the risk. Less well, they work to communicate with regulators and consumers, showing that the grid is becoming more secure. And this, because it, it is always a problem to use the same tool for different necessities. And so 
I will skip those <laughs> two slides and come to my final uh, slide in which uh, I say that the real problem to use metrics for regulatory purposes is uh, the issue of uh, data management. That is uh, usually when uh, you adopt a performance-based regulation, you, you have a top-down uh, approach to data collection. You, the regulator, decide the indicators, the companies provide the values, and then you, you, you the regulator, use uh, those values for your activity, performing audits and controls on data collection methodologies. Here, it is difficult to implement such an approach of the governance of data management because uh, the provision of information uh, implies also disclosing critical information. Uh, and secondly, the full cooperation of the company is necessary. So this is uh, not feasible when you use uh, metrics uh, or, uh, to establish the economic incentive for, your, for the company. Yes, thank you very much for listening. And uh, here you will find the links for the download and all the contacts of the author of uh, the guidelines. I have to thank also all the regulators of Southeast Europe, uh, European and American, who contributed to the preparation of the guidelines. Thank you, Elena. Um, and just for all our attendees out there, uh, we will be sending around the presentation so you will be able to uh, download these uh, publications um, and see any, any slides that Elena has missed. So thank you again, Elena. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Michael. Great, thank you. Okay. So let me know if uh, Jake, if my slides are coming up. Yep, it's all good. Great. All right, thanks. Um, I'll try and move the. Here we go. Okay. Um, Michael Kaleo, I am the manager of uh, what we, we acronym DPNA at Arizona Public Service. Um, just wanted to go through quickly. Um, let's see if I can move this. Sorry. Um, just some of the projects that we're working on, so I can kind of uh, give some. Uh, real life concepts to a lot of the principles that um, Elena talked about um, and what we're working on right now. Um, Jake had already mentioned I've been with APS for seven uh, years, six of them in, in my current role as manager of uh, DPNA. Some of the major projects I've been associated with uh, during this time are the establishment of a data privacy framework for APS to follow for uh, customer data protection robust third-party vendor risk management program, um, enhancement of our identity access management controls, particularly around 24-hour uh, access revocation upon employee separation from APS. And finally, we are uh, in the midst of two extremely large projects at the moment. Um, we are undertaking our uh, migration to the cloud, O365, with uh, cloud tenant as well as we are replacing our homegrown identity access management system. So that's a multi-year project. Just thought um, some of you might enjoy a little bit of um, a background on EPS, and um, I'm happy to answer questions after, after or you know, within if, if we have time. Company is about 135 years old. Started as Phoenix Light and Fuel Company. Uh, we service 11 counties from metropolitan Phoenix all the way to the Grand Canyon. 4,000 megawatts of generating capacity. We are operators of America's largest uh, nuclear generating station, Palo Verde, which is about 55 miles outside of uh, downtown Phoenix. Uh, we generate electricity for uh, nearly 3 million Arizona customers and businesses. So that's about half of the state. And we have 6,300 employees uh, and 2,000 temporary contractors. So who are APS's regulators? Um, as is typical of all US utilities, there is uh, regulation on both the state and federal level. Um, at the state, we are regulated by um, a PUC, Public Utility Commission, you probably hear that term quite often. Um, <clears throat> in our case, the PUC is the Arizona Corporation Commission and a little bit different in terms of how Arizona uh, regulates, not just um, electric utilities, but telephone, cable, 
Um, the ACC is its own separate governing body. So Arizonans uh, vote specifically for those commissioners. They are not um, appointed by um, any, any governing board at the state level, although the governor does report, uh, does appoint uh, a commissioner if, if one was to uh, leave prior to the next term in terms of election. That gives uh, the ACC a lot of independence and power over um, how they regulate um, utilities. Uh, on the federal side, uh, just a, a, an overview of how regulation for our, our, our non-United uh, States um, utility partners on the call may, may find this informative. Uh, the United States electricity infrastructure, um, the interconnected grid is really the entirety of North America, making up uh, Canada and, and Mexico as well. While FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, only um, regulates the American portion of the grid, it is all interconnected and regionally, um, the governing bodies really work together. So um, FERC sits on top of the hierarchy by setting requirements and standards for operating and it delegates its authority regionally. In the case of us being a West, um, Western utility, we fall into uh, the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, WEC. So all of our regulation is um, administered through WEC with FERC really deputizing uh, WEC as its, its governing authority. From the ACC side, um, from a cybersecurity standpoint, the ACC has the ability to open legal dockets to make inquiries of our program. In the past, they have opened uh, data privacy dockets as well as uh, requesting formal meetings with our senior leadership over security. They have even requested a FERC assessment of our program. That happened about a year and a half ago, um, not to get into the political aspects of how um, AP, a, APS has uh, worked with, with our um, our public utility commission uh, hasn't always been a um, happy uh, happy relationship, and the FERC assessment was probably um, a little bit of a "hey, keep you guys honest" type of thing. And I can get into that a little bit later in terms of uh, our, us being able to demonstrate our maturity of of what that FERC assessment uh, really entailed. Um, in terms of FERC and WEC, um, SIP. Critical infrastructure protection standards is really the framework that all uh, American utilities must abide by in terms of cybersecurity maturity and um, protection of infrastructure. Um, I put in my notes these 11 standards. It's actually 12, though they're numbered through 13. 13 has been the most recent one that was added, which is around vendor risk and vendor management. Um, these standards really dive into patching, vulnerabilities, access revocation, and an area that um, my team is really responsible for in terms of governance, which is BCSI, which is Bulk Electric System Cyber System Information. That's really an acronym inside of an acronym. Um, Three-year on-site audit cycles are, are common, are really the, the norm, I guess, pre-COVID, you would say. Um, where the regulators are live and in person with, with the utility for a week and a week prior to that making data requests. So when they um, show up on site, you're doing your um, panel style audits, um, you know, sitting in front of uh, the WEC auditors and they are reviewing your policies, conducting interviews and documenting their findings. So interaction between regulators and, and what to expect. <clears throat> started this off by explaining it's generally friendly, uh, but distant. Um, in terms of my six years in, in working with our, our regulators, I have honestly had zero interaction with our state regulators. So the ACC has interviewed our general manager of security, our, our, our GM who is over both physical security and cybersecurity. Some of the commissioners have asked for um, interviews with, with, with our GM. They have not put him in front of the uh, commission in a uh, public settings, but just to get to know our, our security program and have conversations. Um, I would say our internal regulatory department has been our counsel and buffer to communication on the state side. Um, we do have quite a lot of uh, interaction with our federal regulators. Uh, we have the ability to reach out to WEC for collaboration sessions when considering policy changes in advance of a change to SIP controls. And that's actually happening right now with, with what we're working on with our O365 cloud migration and how we would build uh, security controls around 
data protection of what we would categorize as our most highly confidential information. Um, we are using data loss prevention tools to scan based on uh, tagging of files and, and putting them in, in the cloud, you know, the Microsoft cloud. And how we're building out those controls and how they align to our SIP standards, specifically around BCSI, we are um, doing some informal collaboration sessions with WEC today, which are, are as I mentioned, really um, set up through our internal regulatory department. They, they really manage the relationship with our federal regulators. Um, they have the ability to ask them questions offline is, and, and then we can really sit down in a, well, not today, we can't sit down formally, but we can do a virtual meeting. Um, so that's, that's really what is common. Um, my experience has generally been to connect with your internal regulatory department um, who will reach out to the federal regulators when there is ambiguity in standards uh, and a pre-consult uh, consultation is needed. The feds are often uh, building collaboration groups amongst the utilities when a SIP standard is being revised. That happened with SIP 13 really for the last year and a half. There were subcommittees of, of utilities that have got together. So um, within our, our utility, our supply chain group, as well as our cybersecurity group, um, we're part of a larger collaboration team that uh, sat down, looked at the standard. We were able to give red line feedback back to uh, FERC and WEC. And those, those feedback items were incorporated into the new standard. Uh, the communication lines are always open and they should be utilized. Uh, managing benchmarks and effectiveness of a cybersecurity program. Um, there's a saying that is used uh, almost weekly in our program. Um, many uh, cybersecurity departments probably do the same, same and can conduct these same type of questions. Um, the risk management saying is the juice worth the squeeze. Um, cybersecurity, which does have the attention of the C-suite nowadays, um, is a commodity. Your resources need to be used wisely. Um, metrics, assessments, risk registers, and peer groups gauge um, your maturity and success, but you also should be mindful of your past success. A uh, mature cybersecurity program with very minor cybersecurity incidents uh, or events may cause internal stakeholders uh, to question the investment in cybersecurity. Should we be having a conversation about a certain level of risk? So in terms of metrics and measurements, what, you know, what is APS uh, measured today? I just wanted to give you a few of them. We don't have a lot of time. I'll try and, and shorten this up. Um, in terms of data loss prevention, we use um, tool sets really to monitor um, the number of what we call flat files, files pulled out of the system of record that contain highly confidential information. And we age those and we see how many of those are over five years. And then we trend those for our business units and ask, management to consider uh, purging those. So we'll, we'll, we'll basically establish a baseline. Uh, we also use a, a metric of top 10 riskiest vendors uh, based on past breaches, uh, low scores in our internal assessment. We do something called the TPRR, which is a third party risk review, uh, where we score vendors that are in possession of our highly confidential information. And as well as we uh, monitor, you know, say large, large organizations like Oracle, um, how often are they being targeted, you know, for uh, uh, attacks and, you know, what, which of those attacks become public? That, that goes into our overall score in terms of our, our comfort of working with that vendor. A couple of the uh, metrics that we'll use on the information security side, time to patch versus SLA, your service level agreements with your IT teams. If it's a high risk patch and high uh, probability that it uh, could be used for some type of vulnerability or attack, we'll have a 24 hour um, clock ticking to take an outage and put that patch uh, into service. And then finally, our, our security operations center, they, they use the, the fun-loving acronym ACDC, the a APS Cyber Defense Center. They use uh, metrics around threats, vulnerabilities, and incidents. What they would um, really narrow the, narrow the target into a, um, into a uh, dartboard, if you will, to say, yes, all these types of things that are going on you know, may be perceived as threats. None of them are really um, anything that would make, make us vulnerable. Some of them are. And then finally, what, which of these are, are actual incidents? And if we see spikes in you know, daily and weekly metrics, we know that we have uh, you know, an issue that we need to take care of. <clears throat> I think I would say you need to set goals for your program um, you know, and, and have your IT teams uh, working very closely with your cybersecurity um, program. 
how well are you living to your metrics? Uh, these are the measurements for success. And I, I mentioned an assessment. C2M2 is a cybersecurity capability and maturity model. We do those on three-year cycles as well, uh, separate from our, our, our FERC audits. Uh, gonna try and go through this quickly. We got about five minutes left. Is it possible to evaluate your cybersecurity uh, investment? I put in here some of the things that I've already talked about. You have your risk registers, which I'm gonna show you an example of what we use. And it, it really ties in nicely to what Elena was showing with uh, a lot of the theories and principles. We certainly use peer groups. We use one called Unite, where um, myself, as well as our management team around our cybersecurity program can ping questions off of other utilities in, in terms of their cybersecurity programs and have some ad hoc discussions on you know, what we're working on. Um, you wouldn't know where you are with your uh, program in terms of its maturity without assessing how often you're attacked. Are those attacks uh, successful as well as any fines that, that you may uh, receive from your, reg your regulatory bodies? We um, you know, have the duty to self-report if we have um, a violation of a SIP standard, uh, specifically in the instance of say 24 hour revocations where you have access to critical infrastructure data, and it's our duty to remove your access within 24 hours of you leaving the company. That's a, a frequently penalized um, uh, substandard of SIP. And, um, you know, with, with those frequent self-reports, um, you know, you're looking at the risk of a fine and, and you know, that kind of speaks to whether or not your, your program is as mature as it should, should be. Jump to a quick example here of what we do in our risk register. And um, I just wanted to provide this as really a high level that shows some of the calculations that we'll use on a one to five scoring matrix. And these are our um, categories that we, we will base a particular um, you know, uh, threat. The likelihood, financial impact, the operational impact, and the reputational impact. Um, I basically was thinking of an example here of what you would be scoring. So say uh, an application that you've inventoried and determined to not have end-to-end -end encryption within that database um, stores highly confidential information. How risky is that? So you, we would use this formula to really bubble that up. And if um, your score is closer to a four or five, we're probably gonna jump on this right away in terms of asking for resources, um, you know, pulling uh, different groups, different business units out of their day in and day out um, responsibilities to put in some type of uh, mitigation plan or controls that would um, in fact close this, this risk. In this case, you would be talking about implementing encryption on a particular database. And if it contained, um, you know, network diagrams, schematics, port names that are uh, potentially an, a, an attack vector for a bad actor to um, uh, prohibit our ability to uh, deliver power to our customers, then this would be a high impact, uh, likely five formula in each of our areas of likelihood, financial impact, operational impact. I didn't have enough room on this slide to put reputational, but um, you kind of get the, get, get the feel here for what we're doing for our, our scoring calculation. I'm sorry that was a little bit quick, um, but I wanted to leave a couple minutes to see if we have any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. That was uh, very help. These case studies um, I find are always very helpful to our audience. Um, so thank you both for your insightful presentations. Um, we do have a, a question from the audience. Um, PBR seems to me uh, applicable to mature operations. Um, cyber is so new and evolving. How can PBR be established and used? It's up to me. <laughs> yeah, you can you can go ahead and kick it off, Elena. Okay. First of all, yeah, the answer is yes. You are perfectly right, and then I'll comment. First of all, uh, I will say performance-based regulation is less used than cost plus. And I say, unfortunately, because it is an effective way to regulate and it is a cost effective way to regulate. It is uh, the cost, the staff required is little. And so you have lower cost for the regulator, which don't, uh, don't uh, forget that pass over the tariffs. But uh, as uh, the question told, uh, Performance-based regulation 
is, has never been used, as far as I know, for cybersecurity. And that I understand very well, because uh, uh, the, the reasons are all included in the last part of my presentation. You, you miss good and practical indicators. It is uh, difficult and costly to collect data. You don't have certified data to base your uh, incentives on those data. So mm -hmm. at present, we are in a situation, I think, uh, where research and experimentation is ongoing. And those who want to establish a collaborative approach may have uh, projects on this. And uh, maybe in the future, we will be able to, to pass to this. Uh, but the first step, uh, if you want to, to go to performance-based regulation, uh, is uh, to provide a good uh, data repository. For, I, I give you an example. Uh, in view of that, the European Commission uh, issued a, direct, a directive and, uh, in which uh, they asked to report on uh, a database all uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents. And this was meant to be the basis to get evidence so to shape the future of policies and regulation. But what uh, was discovered afterwards is that uh, the use is that uh, an incident is reported only when it is really an incident. It is when uh, the attack has an effect. But if the attack is re resolved without any effect on the IT, system, it is not reported. And this is, of course, a bias. Uh, so just to say that it is important to, to build the data collection uh, process, uh, system. And once it is strong, then you can start to, to speak of performance-based regulation. Right. That makes sense. Um, Michael, do you have any comments on that? Or it's OK I, if you don't. I agree. Yeah, no, I agree with what Elena shared. Yeah, no, totally agree. OK. <laughs> Um, and a, a question for you, Michael, um, the concept of risk acceptance by utility seems to be necessary, um, but given the fluid situations uh, in cyber, how often uh, should a utility reevaluate its risk uh, acceptance? Uh, it's an interesting question. We, um, we seem to get it a lot more recently in terms of um, should we be accepting some some level of risk? And I think we we use our risk register. And if if something is um, lower on the scale of a you know one or two, um, you know we we probably wouldn't put a mitigation plan in. But um, generally, um, I think our cybersecurity executive leadership holds a lot of sway with um, our C suite. And you know w when a data owner or a particular business unit within our organization. Is basically saying they're comfortable with um, a certain level of risk that we are not comfortable with. Um, I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but uh, <laughs> cybersecurity uh, wins. So um, you can you can accept certain levels of risk. Probably if you're talking about a you know an application and sharing that information um, you know outside of your organization, if it's more in the you know proprietary type of information. But if you're getting into confidential and highly confidential data, for instance, or something specific that's uh, critical infrastructure, we're just not going to have a lot of tolerance for risk. And, you know, we're not going to be open to a conversation, you know, in that, in that aspect. And I don't think our senior executives are either. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we just got another question. I think this is going back to the, the PBR. Um, does this uh, evaluation method include cybersecurity level at the operational uh, technology OT level? Um, as opposed to the IoT level? I would say yes to both. In, my, in our case, um, we're, we're evaluate, evaluating governance of a particular design as well as, it, as its application. Um, so we have our uh, enterprise architects and security architects involved in projects, you know, from what we call stage gate zero through you know, stage gate, gate five, which would be implementation. And there's testing phases that are going on in between. So um, you, know, you, you have to pass a concept as well as the, its application, you know, and you're val evaluating your, your risk in, in all of those environments. So I guess the, from my perspective, the answer is just yes. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Excellent. Um, and we have uh, one one final question uh, for both of you. Um, CapEx versus OpEx seems to be a strong argument for OpEx. Um, however, since OpEx is not readily available on the market, uh, what would be your advice to utilities to start working on OpEx? Um, Elena, do you want to do you want to start with that one? I can finish. Uh, I will start. Um, Generally, the regulatory view is uh, to focus on capex, on investment, and to leave uh, the companies to focus on operational uh, expenses. In the guidelines, in many points, uh, I come back to that decision, and then I underline that uh, you must keep uh, your eye also on operational expenses just because uh, operational expenses are uh, connected to priority one and priority two. That is the management of, uh, of cybersecurity program and uh, the training or hiring high level staff uh, turns in operative cost. And so if you, uh, the regulator, are considering just capital expenses, you risk an overinvestment in capital and to uh, under-evaluate the problems of governance and of labor on end of your staff. This is why it is important uh, to work on, on uh, operational expenses because they are the translation of those two important objectives. Establish a good strategy, uh, processes and work on your stuff. I'll quickly add from a, an American utility perspective and a, a, an investor owned utility, which is, is what APS is. We are um, publicly traded. Um, from a finance standpoint, uh, American utilities that are uh, investor owned uh, generate um, revenue and profit on, on capital, which is odd. Uh, we have to invest in order to earn a return on investment. We don't make money on our, our revenues. Essentially, you, you know, your revenues and your expenses are break even. So your OPEX is what establishes your day in and day out responsibilities. Our, our cybersecurity program is funded by um, an OPEX budget. We are generally not going to get additional funding in OPEX uh, during the course of the year. So we are establishing, you know, for instances in terms of risk, what our, our, our um, you know, risk register shows is our areas that we need to focus on in, in terms of a mitigation plan. And then those mitigation plans generally turn into a design. So you would use um, CapEx to build a project to close those gaps. So that's generally how we, how we work. We would focus on capital, you know, for enhancements to programs and, and for break fix. Um, I, OPEX will be our, our maintaining of our program, the governance, the consultation that we do on a day in and day out basis. Great, well, thank you so much uh, again, Elena and Michael for um, your presentations. I hope they were um, helpful to our audience. Um, uh, to all of our attendees, there's a quick survey after the webinar. Um, your participation is greatly appreciated. If you have any comments, um, please feel free to write them in the open-ended question. Uh, my email is also on the slide. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar and the presentations on our website. Um, and with that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week and uh, weekend. Stay safe, everyone.